for it to, to start here. How do I collapse the screen a bit, Keith? It's taken over my whole screen. Oh, um, let's see. I think that it will stop in just a moment. OK, good. Thank you. So now oh, I think. Fantastic. Great. OK. Here we are. OK, so now, now we begin. So hello to all of you out there um, and, and those of you in here in our Zoom conversation. Um, this is another installment of the Cosmos Online Open House series. Our guest today is Dr. Kevin McGraw, um, someone I've been very privileged to work with for quite a while um, in the context of the ancient Greek hero in uh, Harvard College. Kevin comes to our teaching meetings and um, very generously, generously shares his long experience with teaching this material. Um, Kevin is an associate of the Department of South Asian Studies at Harvard University. Um, instructor of the Ancient Greek Hero at the Extension School, which is starting very soon. I can add, you can still sign up, I believe. And poet in residence at Lowell House at Harvard College. So, Kevin, you're a familiar face. It's good to see you here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Keith. And thank all of you for being here today and inviting me to uh, be with you. Now, what I would like to talk about is moral Odysseus, or what Greg would refer to as Odysseus as an exponent of decay. <clears throat> and let's do this in three stages. Let's look at the various patterns or paradigms of the moral within the poem. Then let's look at how those paradigms or constitutions are expressed through the narration. And then thirdly, and briefly, let's look at how those moments of narration actually have moral effect. So that, that's our trajectory for today. Um, Janet, do you want to, do you have my notes? Do you want to read the first two passages uh, from scrolls one and five? Do you have them or not? No, uh, Jackie, do you have them? I have them handy. I can be a backup. Right. Masha, Masha is raising her hand, I think. Okay. Oh, oh no, sorry. Maria, Maria, Maria is raising her Ma Maria. So, so Maria, could you read from scrolls one and five, the first uh, two passages? Read them loudly, quickly, and dramatically. Yes. So it, this, is, uh, this is from your handout, if I'm not mistaken. Right, notes, yes. Okay, yes. Well, the one is from book one, uh, uh, I think verse 28. The other gods met in the house of Olympian Zeus, and the father of gods and men spoke first. Oh my, how mortals hold us gods responsible, I, Tioi, for they say that their misfortunes come from us. They receive their sufferings beyond what is fated by way of their own acts of recklessness, Atastaliae. How can I forget godlike Odysseus than whom there is no more capable man on earth in regard to Nose, no more liberal in his offerings to the immortal gods that live in the sky? Bear in mind, however, that earth in cycler Poseidon is still furious with Odysseus for having blinded an eye of Polyphemus, king of the Cyclops. Therefore, though he will not kill Odysseus outright, he torments him by preventing him from his homecoming, Nostos. We have made up our minds that he is to have his homecoming. And um, book 528, tell Calypso that he had decreed that poor enduring, enduring Odysseus is to return home, Nostos. Um, now, thank you, Maria. Should but, I move on, or no, should that's I? That's enough. We, maybe okay. you can read later on when we come to that passage. Great, thank so, you. <clears throat> so the poem begins then with a discourse between Zeus and Athena, 
And in this discourse, Zeus makes a speech act, and that becomes the plot of the poem. And then in scroll 24, Zeus and Athena re-encounter, and Zeus makes another speech act, which terminates the plot of the poem. And curiously, and synoptically, if you like, you have a similar model with the Homeric Iliad, where Zeus and another feminine deity, Thetis, um, are in dialogue in, in scroll one, and Zeus makes a speech act, which becomes the plot of the poem. And then in scroll 24, Zeus and Thetis re-engage, and Zeus makes another speech act, which terminates the plot of the poem. And both these poems occupy a lapsed time of about 40 days. So there is a, there's something, um, there's an identity here. And remember that Zeus is the source of decay, of the moral in the cosmos. So when he makes a speech act, he is transmitting that um, social form into human life. Now, we've say, we, we have said that Zeus makes the speech act, which uh, delivers the plot of the poem. Well, you can say, how, how is that? How is it that the words of Zeus are connected with the plot of the poem? What's the, what's the metonymy there? What's the connect, connective tissue? How does this happen? What's the causality? And this is an extremely important question, and it's something I've spent many years trying to resolve. Because, as you know, in our early 21st century culture, we live in a uh, completely uh, non, in a completely secular world, essentially, um, where we explain the natural world and the universe through scientific method, through rational observation and rational influence, inference and the delivery of theories. Whereas in this late Bronze Age culture, manifest by the two poems, which is say 3000 years ago, you have a culture that is a society that is pre-literate, there's no writing, it's pre-monetary, there's no money, and it's totally non-secular. There's not even a conception of what it means to be an atheist. So they understand their world, not simply as a natural order, which is subject to rational observation. Their world is a world that is supernatural. The wind possesses a divine force. The sunlight is a divine agency. The grain in the fields has this cosmic energy within it. And they explain how this world operates through metaphor and through poetry. That is how they understand um, their natural world and their supernatural world, which are essentially identical. And that is where the moral is to be located. So if we're going to understand this literature, we have to be very careful in putting aside our early 21st century uh, intellectual baggage and approaching this literature from a very specific internal point of view. If you don't have writing, you have communication is different and recollection is different. If you don't have money, the relationship with objects are different. And similarly, uh, the distinction between the male and the feminine is extremely different. Consciousness is different in this culture. So in any kind of approach, intellectual or uh, close reading approach to Homeric poetry, we have to be aware of this that we cannot enter into this, this, this world uh, thinking as we do. We have to try and understand how they think, what their emotions are composed of and by. And then thirdly, Zeus mentions that Poseidon is tormenting Odysseus. Well, he's not. In Zeus, Poseidon appears briefly in scroll five and talks to himself aloud for a few lines. And during the, the, that speech, he doesn't even mention his son, Polyphemus, uh, the Cyclops. What he does is raise a tempest which capsizes the vessel of Odysseus, which he's been sailing for almost three weeks, and Odysseus is forced to swim ashore. That is the only 
mention, that is the only presence of Poseidon in the poem um, or in the plot, shall we say. Now, the Cyclops though is going to be very important for us in about half an hour. So let's just put a star there, put an asterisk by this word Cyclops and we'll return to it. So in what Maria read, there were three indications of moral agency in the Homeric Odyssey, in, the, in this language of, of Zeus. There is fate, there's destiny, mortals are fated. Um, there is the speech act of Zeus, which we have discussed. Um, and then there is this question of human volition or human moral agency, which is here given in the negative. They are reckless, they are inept, they do not observe moral equilibrium. So let's look at this, this question then of um, fate. Well, there is no fate in the Homeric Odyssey. It, it's not a part of the, of the narrative. Whereas in the Homeric Iliad, you have Zeus and Thetis uh, several times discussing how Achilles is fated to die. And when uh, Hector is about to die in scroll 22 and Sarpedon in scroll 16, um, Zeus observes that ah, this is how it must be. So in that poem, fate is this irrational grain which enters into the narrative, but it, it, without any explanation. It simply impinges into the plot and affects the plot, but we don't know what that connectivity is. Whereas in the Homeric Odyssey, fate is, it's not there, it's not part of our of our um, narrative structure. The speech acts of Zeus, we've already looked at and we'll refer to that in a minute. Um, and then we have the, the moral life of individuals, human volition and moral agency. Now, let me propose a thesis for today. That is that commensality C-O-M-M-E-N-S-A-L-I-T-Y, commensality, which means communal dying, dining, is the governing metaphor which founds, lays the groundwork for moral action in Homeric Odyssey. Um, and in that sense, guest host relations that es establish these moral conditions, um, the protocols of what occurs between a guest and a host are the founding elements of moral action within a community. And here I would include uh, blood sacrifice or sacrificial cuisine, where the deities are invited, invoked and invited to, the, to appear on the sacrificial ground. They are given the burnt offerings, which they imbibe as aromatic smoke. Um, the mortals consume the cooked flesh of the immolated animals. And for what happens down there in the underworld beneath their feet, there are libations, perhaps of blood. And down there are the ancestors and the deceased heroes. So that is how commensality as a metaphor is laying the ground for moral action within a community. The circulation and exchange of food is something that is ideally reciprocated. And as you know, reciprocity, reciprocity is, lies at the heart of any moral action. You cannot have moral behavior without some understanding or apprehension of uh, reciprocity. So you have the exchange and circulation of food. You have the giving of guest gifts, which is a very interesting topic. Um, you have these blood sacrifices and you have libations. This is how we understand commensality. And this is what I would propose to you is lies at the heart of moral activity within this poem. Now, let's look at the text. Kevin, before you, before you go on, there's a question from someone watching on YouTube about okay. speech acts. And I think that is the term that we use in English, but in Homeric Greek, is there um, a specific term that's used to refer to this kind of thing um, that you're talking about, the speech acts of Zeus or Athena? Not in this conceptual sense that we, which we are using. This, this idea of speech acts comes from 
some lectures that John Austin gave at Harvard in the 60s. And the, the lectures were published as how to do things with words. And if I said, um, Janet is sitting on a chair, that's true or false. She is or she isn't. But if I said, um, Ellen, stand up. That's a speech act. And it is not true nor, nor false, but it is effective or not effective because either Ellen stands up or she doesn't stand up. So this is a particular kind of language which is vital for the functioning of rituals. It is important in, in oath, it is important in boasting, um, and it is important in social contracts. So does that answer you, you, the, the question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that it does. Um, I hope person will continue chatting if, if needed. And um, for anyone in the conversation here, do you have any questions? Please just speak up because I can't see you all. Yes, uh, I, I do. Jackie. Okay. Go ahead, Jackie. I wanted to ask you, Kevin, when you talked about fate, uh, unless you don't want to go back to it, because that's what I don't understand. As Zeus says it's fated, Poseidon, when he sees Odysseus near Phaeacia, says, oh, I guess all the other gods got together and said, it's okay, he goes home. And then he says, but it's appointed, it is fated that he reaches his homeland. How does Zeus know? I mean, uh, uh, Poseidon know. He was always visiting the Aethiops and he wasn't there at that feast when they all talked about it. Right. So where right. does the fate come in here? Right. It's right. understood then, right? It's, it's a very good question. How does Zeus know what Poseidon is thinking, for instance, to, to turn the question around in the other okay. way? What, what do these, how do these deities, uh, how are they um, comprehensive as to what the other deities are doing? And if you look at the Homeric Iliad, it's that they are. The, 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 these deities know what the other deities are doing. And it's particularly with Zeus, who is omniscient. But this is what I, I mean, um, Jackie, that we can't apply our early 21st century Western mm -hmm. rational view of the cosmos to this culture, because the point you raised is an extremely important point. Um, in terms of what is actually happening between uh, the deities as they operate as deities and make these speech acts. And the deity, the language of a de any deity is always going to be a speech act. So yeah, it's, this is- It just it, is. <laughs> well, it is, unless we closely read the text and come up with some uh, hypothesis to explain it, which I haven't done, but maybe that's a great task for you. <laughs> <laughs> And it's a really important point, and I have thought about this. Yeah. So, and particularly how Zeus knows what Poseidon is thinking and doing yeah. from the other okay. point. Of view. So let's go back to commensality and the beginning of the poem. And the first terrestrial scene concerns commensality. The first scene is on. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Kevin, I don't want to interrupt. Just a very yeah. uh, minor remark, uh, Keith, if I may. Uh, just to drop it, and perhaps you dismiss it as irrelevant or as not as uh, important. But uh, I actually was always inclined to address these fate issues as a matter of, um, uh, of being the fate as a kind of a alternative to the master poet na narrative. Because if Sarpedon dies, we don't have the fall. Just somehow the whole story changes. So the, the whole Iliad changes. If uh, Odysseus doesn't return, there's no Nostos. Uh, the tradition somehow falls apart. So there's perhaps not a way to uh, to interpret it rationally or to follow, let's say, a, a to Z a line of thought in the way we rationalize it and we can accept it. You know. But uh, in a theoretical, uh, from a theoretical point of view, uh, I think one can follow um, that after all, you cannot really um, change the narrative, I mean, the, the tradition in this sense. That would be mine, but uh, yes, I don't want now to continue. Yeah, just to, to drop it. Uh, okay. Relevance. Thank you, Georgia. That's a, an, another extremely important point. Um, and in response, let's say, well, if the plot is engaged by Zeus, that is that's like putting your putting a record on the record player. It, it just goes round and round until the end of the record. You cannot change that. If Zeus has established this plot, uh, that is how it is. 
But to go back to our earlier point, Georgia, what we understand as fate, and this is the miasma, which I always try and avoid, what we understand as fate is perhaps not how these late Bronze Age people understand fate. Consciousness is very different from them. Um, fate for us concerns the overriding of individual volition. Is that the case in late Bronze Age uh, epic poetry, for instance? Um, I don't know, because their understanding of the, the universe, of the natural world, is a supernatural world. And this idea of fate, of Moira, is, is part of that world. And it's as if even Zeus himself and the other deities are subject to fate at certain times. So there's, a, there's an extra sphere in the cosmos, an Empyrean, if you like, which also influences the deities. So all I can say, Georgia, is that before we can make those questions, we have to understand how these people are using the word fate. And you, perhaps you could do a word search and see what the semantic field is when that term is used, see what the semantic field that is generated. You see my point, Georgia? Yeah, it's a, it's a very important question, but it's again, one of these questions which requires a lot of separate work and research. So let's go back to commensality and the, the opening of the poem. And you have right at the poem, as the poem begins in this terrestrial world, you have good commensality and bad commensality. You have the suitors who are these horribly uncouth thugs who are offensive to their hostess, Penelope. They plan the homicide of Penelope's son, Telemachus. They uh, morally and sexually deprave the, the staff of Penelope. They are violent. They throw the furniture around at some, on some occasions. Um, they consume gigantic quantities of meat, cooked meat and of wine. And remember in this culture, the primary, uh, the primary source of human wealth is livestock. And they perform no sacrifices, even though there's an altar of Zeus in the palace of Odysseus, the, the suitors perform no sacrifices. And on the two occasions where they are said to perform libations, the poets describe how this is just a tiny few drops. And they have been doing this for over between three and four years. This is, this is, this is criminal. This is absolutely outrageous. So, and I cannot stress that point sufficiently. What the suitors are doing is just horrific. Um, and then at the same point in the poem, you have this chap arriving from Taphos who says, my name is Mentes. And Mentes is of course, Athena. And Athena behaves with, as a guest with impeccable manners. She observes all the protocols and principles of the good guest. And Telemachus, who receives her as host, observes all the protocols and principles of being the good host. So that's how the poem opens. You have these two models of commensality, bad commensality and good commensality, the disregard of the protocols of uh, moral equilibrium and the observation of the protocols or principles of moral equilibrium. And the poem ends, as you know, with these three uh, with this lineage, heroic lineage, dining together in scroll 24, uh, Laertes, Odysseus, and Telemachus, just before they go off to uh, fight with this, this, the kin, kinsmen of the suitors. And in the center of the poem, you have the worst possible situation where you have a bad host and you have a bad guest. And the host practices homophagy and eats his guests and the guests steal food from their host. They make him drunk so he's vomiting all night. They blind him in this excruciatingly painful fashion. And then they take more food and insult him and uh, are extraordinarily offensive. And this is the, the situation on the island of the, the Cyclops, as you know. And there are many other instances of good commensality or bad commensality which have moral consequences in terms of equilibrium and disequilibrium. Those are our three principal examples. Um, any questions before we press on? No? Yes, Maria. 
Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add to this faith issue that we talked about, that faith uh, in terms of words um, takes many forms, especially in the Iliad, as you pointed out. So for example, we shouldn't forget uh, how many times we read the word cares. Right. Right. So uh, this right. is just, I, I add this to George's uh, comment. So this was not a question, just um, an addition. Right. A very important addition, because if we're going to talk about faith, we have to go and do our homework. We have to sit down and do a word search and look at the passages and see what the semantic field is, which surrounds these words. Otherwise, we're just talking about the 21st century. Uh, which is interesting, but it's not really uh, contributing to our understanding of the poetry. So let's press on then. Now, let's make a brief detour. Um, and I would like it to be longer, but we don't have time. And let's, let's quickly see how the Hesiodic poets in Works and Days talk about uh, moral equilibrium and moral disequilibrium. And at the beginning of Works and Days, the poets talk about two kinds of drive, two kinds of eris, E-R-I-S, which cause disequilibrium or are uh, causative of equilibrium. And this is very unlike the system, the mosaic system, which Keith studies in his research, uh, where you have the prescriptive order of thou shalt do this and thou shalt not do this. Here, moral equilibrium or decay concerns a dynamic equilibrium. So if you have a situation which is horribly wrong and horribly outrageous, therefore the uh, retribution which will stabilize this situation and bring it back to a, a level of moral stability is also going to be extreme. And there is the, the temporal quality to all this because the poets talk about how there is a right moment for all action, um, horror for the actions of work, plowing, pruning, seeding, um, and the actions of ritual propriety when it is that one should uh, perform a ritual. And then the third point about the moral paradigms of human life concern oath, social contract, uh, covenant, the speech act between two parties or two individuals which establishes a moral ground. So that's in a nutshell, the Hesiodic point of view. Now, if we look at how this idea of um, the moral is legally practiced or in terms of jurisdiction in Homeric poetry, we have another interesting aspect or dimension uh, on this literature. Um, and again, it's, you have a situation which is virtually synoptic. Now, there is no legislation, of course, that doesn't occur to classical times, as you know. And there is no judgment by a king or a kingly figure who adjudicates between contending parties. That doesn't occur. What you have is a situation, a legal situation of mutual retribution or mutual uh, retaliation. And in Latin, we refer to this as lex talionis. And the, the ancient Hebrews, again, Keith's field, would gloss this kind of system of jurisdiction as an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. Or it's what in the Eastern Mediterranean nowadays is still referred to as vendetta. So it's a system that of public knowledge of what is correct. And if um, there is a misdemeanor in that correct action. There is a, a convention for retribution, or um, as Greg would say, a metonymy of violence. So if Keith comes to my house tonight and steals 10 of my sheep, well, on Sunday, by this convention or by these customs, I am entitled to go to Keith's brother's house on Sunday night and steal 12 of his goats. There is this, this action and reaction which stabilizes uh, the moral conditions within a community. And these apply to all kinds of criminality, not just the theft of cattle, but to adultery, to homicide, and so on. Now, 
in the Homeric Iliad, there are two actions which civilize this kind of customary or conventional practice. Um, one is apoina, A-P-O-I-N-A, -A, which we can uh, describe as ransom or price. And the other concerns poine, P-O-I-N-E, with an accent over the E. Um, and let's call that blood price. Now, to be brief, the Homeric Iliad opens with a situation where a poiner is being offered, where the, 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 the priest of Apollo comes and offers uh, a poiner for his daughter who has been captured by Agamemnon. And you can read about this in the epic cycle. And Agamemnon, of course, says, forget it, she's my concubine. And then the, there are many occasions where a poiner is uh, active, either in offering or in rejection. And the, the scroll 24 closes with the offering of a pointer where Priam comes and offers a certain amount of wealth for the body of Hector. Poine is slightly different because it's, it's specific to homicide. So if um, Jackie's brother and my nephew went hunting in Montana and, my, and Jackie's brother was uh, cleaning his gun one night and forgot about the round in the chamber and the gun went off and killed my nephew, I would be entitled in this system of uh, uh, mutual uh, retribution to go and do something horrible to one of Jackie's nephews or to another of her brothers. Or Jackie could say, listen, Kevin, this was, I'm so sorry, this was a horrible occasion. Please accept this shiny new Mercedes Benz and let's, let's, let's live as we used to. That is point A. And this is something that occurs specifically in terms of Achilles and the death of his charioteer Patroclus and his refusal to accept point A, although he takes these 12 uh, young warriors and cuts their throats as part of his point A. Um, now, in Homeric Odyssey, in scroll 22, where Odysseus begins to cause or conduce to the death of 108 suitors and their henchmen, and to um, cause the uh, execution of 12 young women and the, the uh, awful mutilation and uh, leaving to hemorrhage of another character, this Odysseus is again refusing to accept a pointer because in scroll 22, Eurymachus, just after the killing has begun, comes to Odysseus and says, stop, stop it, Odysseus. And Eurymachus is one of the elders amongst the suitors. He says, stop this. We will all bring you a certain amount of wealth as retribution for what has been happening. And because the suitors have been so bestial and so thuggish um, and so outrageous, hubristic, Odysseus says, forget it, and kills Eurymachus and causes the death of all the others. And then in scroll 24, when uh, Odysseus and Telemachus are in the hills hiding, and the, the kinsmen of the suitors come heavily armed to kill them, again, retribution, Zeus terminates the poem at that point with a speech act, with a thunderbolt, and Odysseus in the last sentence is said to um, enter into a social contract, into a covenant. Um, again, he is rejecting all possible application of poine. So this is how the legal situation within these poems uh, operates. We have in terms of our moral paradigms, then we have the speech acts of Zeus, we have this metaphor of commensality, we have conventions of violence, and then the practice of oath, which establishes moral equilibrium. Now, Kevin, but, yes. I wonder if I might ask a quick question about the oath. Right. Uh, some of us have just been reading through the passage where Odysseus is in disguise and takes an oath that Odysseus will exact the retribution you've just been talking about against the suitors, and yet he is in disguise. So is this a valid speech act because it's Odysseus speaking it, or is it an invalid 
speech act because he is pretending to be somebody else saying it. Um, Janet, that's an extremely subtle question. Um, I, I address that in right at the end of what we're going to talk about today because okay, yes, thank you. Odysseus is in disguise there. He's not King Odysseus. Um, and the, the reception of that speech act is going to be different, isn't it? So if I say Janet, um, sorry, if I say Sarah, st st stand up and you don't stand up, perhaps it's because you and I don't have a relationship and you don't really know what I'm talking about when I use this imperative. So yes, he is in disguise and it, it, it's a problem, but it's nevertheless a speech act, but it is a failed speech act, just as um, Achilles in scroll 16, when he pours the libation to Zeus, uh, about the return of Patroclus makes us fail speech act. So, um, and then the other point, Sarah, is that Odysseus is speaking within the frame of the, not just the plot, but in the frame of being overseen and mentored by Athena. And this is something we'll talk about in a while. Right, she, because she disguised him in the first right. place. Right. Yeah. So yeah. you see there are, there are Again, you, if you're going to answer these questions, you have to sit down and do a lot of homework. Um, yeah, for sure, but I thought, quick oh. shortcut to ask you. <laughs> and before you can actually respond and say, this is how it is, or this is yeah. how I think it is. So it's a very interesting question and it's a beautifully subtle question, but one has to look at the, the, the details, the textual details before responding. Um, and I hope we will be able to do that in the next, 40 minutes or so, okay? Um, right, and so let's move on to our second point, how the, these constitutions of the moral or these paradigms of the moral are expressed in the narrative. Now, in a book that came out last year, I made great use of a conceptual tool, an analytic tool, an instrument for analysis in which the, the distinction between plot and story was vital. Plot is the causal sequence of events. A causes B causes C causes D. Story is the um, temporal sequences of, of events. A is prior to B, is prior to C, is prior to D. So if I said, a man walked into the bar, shot the barman, grabbed the bag of money and went outside and took a taxi to the airport and flew to Delhi and married the princess. That's the plot. If I said Henrietta one day had put on this beautiful uh, short blonde wig, looking very boyish, and she'd actually uh, glued a, a false beard to her chin, and she went downtown on her motorcycle and parts her outside the Ritz and took her helmet off and she went inside and asked the concierge, where's the bar? That is the beginning of the story. You see the distinction? And another example, in a, a seminar I gave a few weeks ago about the film by Mingela called The English Patient, you have two locations. You have Italy and you have um, North Africa. And Italy, is in the present and the time in Italy is, is uh, continues for about eight days. Whereas what you have in North Africa is in the past and it, it, it continues, the, the, the narrative there continues for three, maybe almost four years. And the English patient who is lying in bed dying in Italy, uh, recollects what happened in Egypt. And this in cinema studies is called flashback. And there are 41 flashbacks in this film, or 41 temporal uh, transitions, sorry. A huge amount of uh, change, temporal change. And what is actually happening is that the narrative in Egypt is the plot and the narrative in uh, Italy is the story. So let's apply this conceptual tool then to Homeric Odyssey and see what we come up with. Um, and I guarantee it's quite interesting. 
So for Homeric Iliad, you have a beginning, a middle, and an end. For Homeric Odyssey, you have many beginnings, many middles, and many ends. The, the, the Homeric Odyssey, the narrative of the Homeric Odyssey is polytropic. It has all these different threads uh, running through it. And we've already observed how the poem has two beginnings in scroll one and scroll five. Now, in this discussion that occurs between Zeus and Athena in these two scrolls, um, they are aware of three places, apart from Troy and Ithaca. Zeus and Athena mention three places in these two conversations that, which they have. The island of the Cyclops, the island of Calypso, and the island of the Phaeacians. Now, Calypso, which is at the center of, of, the, of, the, um, of this model, Calypso is mentioned 34 times in the poem. She, she, the, the, she is fascinating for the, for the poet. There's something about Calypso which is very important. And she, her island is described as the, the navel of the sea, the omphalos, which is where the, the, the human being is attached to the mother, you remember. And on either side of Calypso, you have these two magical islands where nobody needs to work. The, the, uh, the livestock produce bountiful milk and so on. Um, and on the Phaeacia, the, 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 the trees are always producing fruit, as, as are the fields. The ships sail themselves. Um, and in both communities, there are no uh, assemblies. There is consensus. There is uh, no disagreement. There is no need for argument. So there's something magically stable about these two communities, except, as we noted earlier, on the island of the Kiklops, you have this chap Polyphemus who likes to eat his guests. Um, and you have these terrible guests who do dreadful things to their host. Whereas on the island of Phaeacia, as soon as Odysseus arrives, when he meets Nafsica, he observes all the protocols of the guest. He is so polite and so courteous. And then he speaks to this young uh, person whom he meets, who is Athena in disguise. And again, he's extremely polite. He is this excellent guest. And the same with Alcinous and his wife and the courtiers in the palace. And the hosts there are bountiful to their guests. They, they give him one of their ships for passage or conveyance back to Ithaca. They give him beautiful clothes and a lot of wealth. And they supply him with these, entertain him to, with these two uh, extraordinary feasts where there's this um, fabulous singer. And at those feasts, Odysseus is not just the, 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 the impeccable guest, but he is this amazing guest because he, he sings this song, this story about a, a voyage, a journey, and they are fascinated. And when he pauses, they are just left in silence. And they say, don't stop, don't stop, carry on. And Odysseus carries on for another two hours. So these are the, this is the, the model which Athena and Zeus are aware of when they are discussing at the beginning of the poem. And let's call this our core narrative, um, this hypostatic or hypothetical narrative of the island of uh, the Cyclops, Calypso, and um, the island of Phaeacia. Now, looking at the, the, the scrolls themselves, well, scrolls one to four, as you know, has nothing to do with Odysseus. He's, he's not present. Uh, we learn about Odysseus through hearsay. People talk about him all the time. Uh, so scrolls one to four then, apart from those two exchanges between Zeus and Athena, are story. They have nothing to do with Odysseus. The scrolls five to eight, are where the plot begins. You remember the speech act of Zeus. Um, and we move from the island of, of Calypso to the island of Phaeacians. And there Odysseus is alone and he is assisted by Athena. Um, so this is by, almost by definition plot. And then in scrolls nine to 12, we have this very strange period, this intermission, if you like, where heroic Odysseus performs his own song. He sings about his, his extraordinary journey. Well, I was in Hades and I saw Heracles and uh, 
I, I listened to the sirens and I slept with Circe for a year and I outwitted the Scylla and Char Char Charybdis and all these other monsters. Um, and he's behaving like a poet here and he's imitating dozens and dozens of characters and voices. He is adept as a poet and both Alkinoos and, uh, and his, his queen, Arite, say, is this, are you really, is this true? Or are you just like a poet? And if you look at the Hesiodic Theogony where the poets describe the muses who inform poetry, they talk about how the muses are good at making the false appear true, how they are good at fiction. And the word is seudia, which is our word pseudo. So let me propose to you then that this is Odysseus promoting himself. I am this great uh, mariner. I am this, this fellow who went into the underworld and uh, listened to the sirens and so on. And it, it works because the, the, the Phaeacians give him this magical ship. They give him all this wealth. Now, note that during this journey, this voyage, Odysseus is not alone. He's with his crew, but there's no Athena. So let's call this our second odyssey. Now, as a footnote, certain scholars have likened this, this journey to the, the journey which Heracles made with his labors or the journey of uh, Jason and his crew aboard the ship Argo, um, where these characters go through certain stations or transitions which influence their consciousness. Now, a book came out, taking this model a bit further, a book came out in 2016 by Maria Bakarova, um, B-A-C-H-A-R-O-V-A. And in this book, From Homer, From Hittite to Homer, she takes the model even further. She says, well, they, this narrative of Odysseus is not even Indo-European. It comes from a Near Eastern source. It's Semitic, and it goes back to the, the poetry of the uh, tradition of Gilgamesh. Now, whether you accept this interpretation or not, um, doesn't really matter. It's just a very interesting way of looking at this data from another point of view, which is always useful. Um, and certainly because of this, because Athena is not present in this, in these scrolls, nine to 12, and because Odysseus is with his crew, um, let us refer to this as story. Then scrolls 12, 13 to 24 are um, Odysseus alone again, assisted by Athena, and he is on Ithaca. The, the, the journey is over almost in, in a geographical sense. Um, and this is, in a, following our logic, is, is plot. And let us just exclude those micro narratives which he exchanges with Umaios and with uh, Penelope. And then finally, there is this very interesting, shall we call it an interpolation in scroll 23, line 310, where Odysseus and Athena are in bed. They just made love, king and queen, uh, husband and wife, uh, father and mother, and they're about to fall asleep in this magical bed. And Odysseus says, well, darling, it, let me tell you, we, we left Troy and we moved to the, 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 the place of the Caconians. And he gives the, the narrative in full. And this is the only place where the narrative, which we think of as the narrative of Odysseus, is delivered in a complete fashion with the beginning and the end. Um, and let's call this our third Odyssey. And let's, let's call it the, the uh, edited odyssey. And I'll talk about this in a minute. So to sum up, we have, um, in terms of scrolls, half the poem on Ithaca, a quarter of the poem on the island of Phaeacia. The first four scrolls don't have anything to do with Odysseus. Um, what are we going to do with this? And from our point of view, in the outer frame, who are looking at this, this visualization, if you like, we see Odysseus on the island of Calypso, we see him on the island of the Phaeacians, and we see him on the island of Ithaca. And 
what we hear about the journey is when Odysseus is performing before the court, where he's telling the courtiers and King Alcinous about his journey. We are not immediate to that information. That's, that's it's, it's secondary for us. So that is how I would try and approach this material by looking at the data, looking at the scrolls and engaging with this conceptual apparatus of the distinction between plot and story. Now, let me just make one extra point here. What we've just done is, um, is not really to construct an argument. What we've done is pedagogical. This is heuristic. This is how we can try and illustrate what is happening in this poem. Whether this is right with these three odysseys, these three models, or wrong or spurious or correct, doesn't really matter. All that I'm trying to do is to illustrate to you how one might understand the, this extremely complex, complicated and complex narrative form. Um, that is all. I'm not trying to present to you arguments. I'm just trying to be heuristic, to be pedagogical and describe, this is perhaps how we can understand this very difficult data. So pause, questions? Georgia. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin, and uh, very inspiring to do further homework, further research and all of this. Um, I'm interested in what you would say um, to the distinction between a legal situation, as you very nicely described and explained, and moral paradigm, because it seems that there is a discrepancy between the legal situation and, and I'm not now projecting my uh, westernized 21st century moral uh, standard, um, but I'm just wondering whether you, you've sent to uh, that what is uh, legally, uh, for them, legally uh, valid is perhaps not always, um, uh, let's say, uh, in practice doesn't always um, uh, um, hit the same uh, chord, you know, morally, for if, if we ever, you know, apply the moral uh, word. For example, the, the issue about Achille uh, and Briseis and Agamemnon, he had every right to keep Briseis, he was forced to give it back, then he had every right, to be, I mean, what, did he have any right not to go back to the battle? Uh, what is Agamemnon's uh, issue? The, the very nice um, uh, exp uh, description of the, of the awful guests and the bad commensality at the, uh, on the island of Kiklops. He was a bad host. Were they, uh, did they have, um, uh, let's say, the moral excuse to be bad guests? You know, all these, uh, about Odysseus too. I'm, I'm wondering whether you, you find uh, this fine line between um, let's say, um, evaluation or assessment of moral paradigm and the, the legal situation in the epic. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very important philosophical point, um, Georgia. Um, I think of the legal situation, which we described as customary or conventional, although what you, the, the point you raised with Agamemnon concerns consensus as to power, Agamemnon is extremely powerful, um, whereas Achilles has, uh, is, is not so powerful. No, but no, I, but I'm sorry, to interrupt, just the, the award. She was awarded with the Briseis and he was entitled to this. This is the only starting point and Agamemnon didn't accept it because of his power. So, but the situation was he was, he was, it was okay for him to keep it in a way. But doesn't matter, I'm sorry. Right, there's a question of consensus. What do, what, what do people publicly agree to here? What does the army, what does the Laos think about what Agamemnon is doing and what Calchas is uh, prophesying and what uh, Achilles is entitled to? Very important questions. What is the, not simply the legal situation here, but what is the moral situation? And I think of the moral as individual and the legal as public. Um, there are conventions concerning cons consensus as to what is correct and what is incorrect. And I think that is how you would answer that question. Uh, what is happening with the Kiklops and Odysseus 
Well, I, I would sort of jump outside and say, well, this, this is metaphor. This is part of how the plot is being constructed. This is the metaphor of commensality. This is what the poets are doing. And I know that's sort of not really responding to your question. That's a sort of meta discourse. Um, but yeah. that's how I would describe it. No, but in a way, I would I would be hoping you'd say I haven't do I haven't. Uh, this is not an idea that came up inspired by you. I wonder, and with this I stop and I thank you again. Whether uh, if there would have been such a distinction, and if the expression of the moral uh, paradigm um, would be so explicit, and it is, we, we see how explicit it is. Uh, I wonder whether it's when we have pl on a plot. Um, so in a way, when it's the, the moral uh, fabric is uh, more evident in the narrative structure. I just idea. That is where I'm trying to take the uh, the, the, the discussion, <laughs> Georgia. You're jumping ahead of me. <laughs> but let, let me just say that it's almost impossible in human life not to be moral. You can be immoral, but to be amoral is almost impossible whether it's in the late Bronze Age or in our society. And just as a very brief footnotes, this is what, the, what was attempted in Libertinage, where the people like Marquis de Sade attempted to actually perform an act which had no moral uh, quality at all. And it was, a, it was a, shall we say, philosophical action, moral action, which was performative. Um, and which they it failed in, of course. So what you're raising, Georgia, are very important points uh, as to what is public and what is, uh, is, is dealt with by consensus and what concerns individual appreciation of uh, moral uh, propriety. So can we move on a bit and I'll try and answer that in, in the next point, okay? All right, um, I see we're running out of time, so I'm going to have to make haste. So just as, a, as a, an addendum to what we've talked about in the last uh, 10, 15 minutes, narrative, if you've just read the Homeric Odyssey for the first time, you're probably not aware of all these complexities of narrative sequence, causal sequence and temporal sequence. Um, and I would say that this is because narrative, the phenomenon of narrative is a cognitive uh, phenomenon. It is, it is not something empirical. And it is, this is how the human mind or the human brain or the activity of human cognition deals with this vast amount of random data in the world. It creates these narratives. Let me illustrate this with an example that if you were arriving at Boston Airport and it was 10 o'clock at night and Sarah was looking down out through the window and she saw the runway appearing, she would also see these electric lamps on the ground arranged in arrowheads. There are five or six of them and they flash in sequence, pulse, 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 directing the, the pilots towards the beginning of the runway. What Sarah would actually see though would be an arrowhead moving across the ground. She would see a narrative. She wouldn't see all these elements, these elements moving in sequence. Her eye or her brain would tell her that the arrow was moving across the ground. And until digital times, this is how cinema worked, where you had tens of thousands of photographs, all slightly different, moving at, say, between 30 and 60 frames per second. And we would see a movie. That is what I mean by narrative is a cognitive phenomenon rather than empir an empirical phenomenon. And that is how I, that is what I would, the lens with which I would look at what we've just been talking about with two writers. One is that in the old pre-literate times, the poets would have had these mnemonic components, these mnemonic systems, which they could fit together. The, the, the telemachy, the arrival on Ithaca, the, um, the, the, the journey of Odysseus as performed in Phaeacia. These are mnemonic moments, which are mnemonic uh, units, which the poets assemble as they perform the poem, depending on how much time they have, or depending on how 
the patron, how much the patron was paying them. It's how the poem comes to mind. Or you could say, well, in not pre-literate pre times, but in um, classical times where the work was obviously edited, this is a work of addition. So that was why when we talked about scroll 23, line 310 and following, those 15 lines, I said that this is probably an interpolation. That's what I meant there. This is something that editors in classical times have introduced into the poem. And there's no evidence for this. I can't make an argument here. All I can say that this is my opinion. This is a, a proposition which I submit to you. Now, let's go back to our asterisk from earlier on the star, the, the Kiklops. For me, the Kiklops is the crucial signifier, the crucial metonym which connects the plot and the story. Now, let me offer to you a rather silly um, metaphor, and it's not a temporal metaphor, it's a spatial metaphor, but it might explain this, because there's something about the Kiklops which is important. And if you look at the number of lines devoted to the Cyclops, it's in, the, in, the, in Odysseus's song, it's, it, the Cyclops receives more lines than anyone else, apart from the, the, the lines devoted to the journey into the underworld. So imagine those old kinds of mattresses, which we used to have before, say, the last 10, 15 years. And you would have bed springs in them, you remember them, and you would have these buttons, upholstery buttons. So imagine we put one of these mattresses on the floor and the buttons are tied, are connected with a thread which runs through the bed springs, which tensions the, blood, the bed spring. So if we put the mattress on the floor and we imagine that the surface of the mattress is the plot and the bottom of the mattress is the story, and there's only one button, that's the cyclops. And it's not simply a connection, it's not simply a metaphor, because around the cyclops, around the button, there is this indentation, there is this depression in the surface, which draws our cognitive apprehension towards that point. Um, I know this is a somewhat of a ridiculous uh, metaphor, but that's how I understand the cyclops. There's something about the cyclops, which is not simply a metonym. There's something attractive. And if you look, go to the museum and look at the black and red figure vase collection, you'll see many illustrations of this event in the poem. Um, and then finally, if, if you're interested, if there are say 10 or 12 prophecies within the narrative, it would be very interesting to look at those prophecies and see how they connect with the story or the plot. It's something I've meant to do for a long time, but I haven't. So um, let's move to our final point and try and wrap up very quickly as time runs away. Any questions before we do that? Keith, anyone with their hand up? Hi, Jackie. Sorry, Jackie. <laughs> another question. That's all this right. Has, uh, I wondered to you, your your quotes that you gave also had a, a similar word in it. it was noose even even in scroll nine where Odysseus is going to go meet uh, go into the cave he talks about DK and noose noose um, so how does that fit in and also it occurred to me I don't know if this is correct or not but the scrolls that you said are without Athena in our readings that we do on the Odyssey the translations. We notice that, especially in Scroll 11, and in those scrolls that he's retelling his own story, he realized it seems like he's inspired by myth. So when the theme is not there, he relies on myth. I don't know. Uh, it, it, is that? It just well, no, seems. I, 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 I would completely agree with you, Jackie. This is the poet performing, drawing upon the tradition, and all these dozens of people, and particularly women. Odysseus is very connected with the feminine in this poem, unlike Achilles in his poem. So yes, he's drawing upon the, the, the traditions of poetry there. He's behaving like a poet. This is, this is not part of the plot of the Homeric Odyssey. Okay? All right. Um, now, let me read the, the, the final uh, passage, which is on my notes. It's number three, um, just for the sake of brevity. And I'll just read the 
one, two sentences of Zeus here. And <clears throat> this is scroll 24, line 477 seven and following. And Zeus says to Athena, was it not by your own plan, your noos, that noble Odysseus came home and took his revenge upon the suitors? And then he says later on, um, let them all become friends and let peace and plenty reign. This is what Zeus says right at the end of the poem. Now, this point about Zeus understanding, um, and it's, it's what somebody else raised earlier on. How do the, the deities know what the other deities are thinking? Um, Zeus says, you planned all this, Athena. And actually, Zeus makes, says the same words almost identically in scroll five, before the plot has even begun. You, you're planning to, for Odysseus to destroy the suitors. So, what I'm going to argue then that Athena is the moral force in the plot. And it is her, not simply her noos, her plan, but it is her words that actually achieve this. And if you do a word search for Athena in the Homeric Odyssey, you'll see her name comes up 151 times. And if you isolate all those occasions, you have essentially the plot. And what is happening is here is she is influencing the, the plot. She is promoting Odysseus. And she does this in a fashion which is polytropic. Because if you look at how she appears in that, past, that moment, right in scroll one where the Athena uh, arrives on Ithaca, she is in disguise. I am Mentes from Tafos. Um, she is polytropic and she's constantly changing her disguises. And she, her first words to Telemachus, I am Mentes from Tafos, is not true, it's a fiction, it's a lie. So verbally, she is um, polytropic. So, and if you look in scroll one line 200 of the Homeric Iliad, Achilles is about to do something too horrible to Agamemnon and Athena appears and seizes him by his blonde hair and pulls him back and says, no, no, Achilles don't do that. And Achilles turns and he sees this immortal fire in her eyes, an amazing scene, um, an amazing vision by the poets, this immortal fire in her eyes. And he realizes that this is the deity. For Achilles, Athena doesn't disguise herself. For Odysseus, Athena is always disguised. She is visually and verbally polytropic. And she is, when we're not simply talking about a narrative of a hero, we're talking about the narrative of a heroic lineage because Athena is constantly influencing uh, Penelope. Penelope just goes up and down the stairs, but her consciousness, her nose is changing. She has her own journey, and as does Telemachus, whom, as you know, is being influenced by Athena. So in the beginning of the poem, he's this boy who bursts into tears. In scroll 22, scroll, um, scroll 21, Telemachus is about to string the bow, and, it, uh, and Odysseus says, no, 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 this is my task. So... Athena is there influencing the plot on all occasions. This is her plot. This is what you were talking about, Georgia, I think. And right at the end of the poem, the last sentence of the poem concerns Athena fulfilling that speech act of Zeus and causing Odysseus to make this oath to establish this covenant, this social contract, which will terminate the violence in the kingdom of Ithaca. So Athena then is the moral force in the poem, but Odysseus is her agent. And the poem that we're talking about here is actually the plot. And the plot begins on the island of um, Calypso. So Athena is, supplies the necessary moral conditions where Odysseus is the, the figure who supplies the sufficient moral conditions for uh, uh, such action. And th that occurs in scroll 22 when he kills the suitors and scroll 24 when he makes this oath. But those two actions in terms of 
causality go all the way back to what happened on the island of Calypso. And that sequence of causality is overseen by Athena. So we have this triform figure. Um, we have Odysseus by hearsay, this acoustic Odysseus, if you like. We have this Odysseus who we mentioned in disguise. And then we have Odysseus from Scrolls 22 to 24, where he is King Odysseus, the her heroic Odysseus, where he performs, he practices these moral actions of violence and of uh, social contract. Um, so we can sum up then by saying that the moral, the moral in the poem concerns the speech acts of Zeus. It concerns these uh, metaphors of commensality, which are the ground for moral action, the primary ground for moral equilibrium or disequilibrium. It concerns the violence of Odysseus and the oath of King Odysseus. That is how we can uh, express the moral activity of this poem. Now, before we close, um, let me just say one final thing, and that is, what we've done today is not really to deliver an argument. We haven't said, well, this is how it is and you can either accept it or reject it. This is correct or this is spurious. All we have done today really is to practice the art of close reading. What we have done is to pursue the methodology of close reading. Whether you agree or disagree with what we've done doesn't really matter. The important thing, which I hope you will take away with you, is this practice of trying to understand the poem on its own terms. And that means reading very slowly and very carefully. And that takes a lot of time. And then making inferences, then making interpretations, and perhaps proposing a few, uh, the construction of a few arguments. That is all we have done. Um, the art of close reading the pursuit of the methodology of how to closely read a poem of this complexity. And this is not simply one of the, the great works of literature in uh, the Western canon. This is one of the great works of art in all of human experience. There are few works of art of this quality of perfection and precision in the world today. So we have to be very careful as readers. We can't be cavalier and say, well, this is what I think and so on. We can say, perhaps this is how it is, but who knows, maybe someone else has a better interpretation. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Um, and that is all I have to say about moral Odysseus. Thank you so much, Kevin, this was wonderful. Um, since we've gone so long, I'm gonna just jump into a couple of questions. Um, Bill and Ian, I see that you have questions and you're still here. Why don't you ask them? Um, Ian, how about you go first? Okay, so um, the commensality uh, question, good and bad commensality, um, could you look at that as a, a fictional uh, axis, so to speak? Where, and But what is not discussed is uh, maybe a real world axis of uh, trade and piracy. So you could look at uh, Odysseus's actions in the Polyphemus cave, cave as just traditional piracy. You come to an island, there are a lot of goats and sheep there. Uh, stupidly, he doesn't steal them, take them back to his ship. He just eats them there. But um, you know, that was a perfectly acceptable activity evidently, according to the Greeks. In the Iliad, you have many uh, references to uh, heroes, uh, you know, despoiling cities adjacent to Troy, and no one thinks anything of it. So, I mean, is there, is there, uh, what do you make of the fact that there's no discussion in, in the uh, Odyssey of the issue of piracy versus trade or travel, uh, there's just this, in your interpretation, the, the moral question of good and bad commensality. Nice, a very nice point. Um, I think Nestor actually talks about pirates being bad people, I seem to recall. 
And what Odysseus does when they leave Troy and go to the, 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 the kingdom of the Kikonians is they behave like pirates. They destroy everything, all the males, they put the males to the death, they take the young women and the women as slaves and concubines and whatever movable wealth they can uh, convey back to their ships. So I think you have to distinguish between civil society and uh, warrior society. If you look at the epic cycle, what happened before the Greeks arrived at Troy, um, and it's mentioned by Andromache and Briseis in, in, in the Homeric Iliad, the Greeks go on these raids, and there's no question of commensality there. They, they, they are raiding, they are destroying, killing, and taking whatever movable wealth they can, and whatever women and girls they can, and killing all the males. So that's how I would approach uh, your point, Ian. You have civil society, which is ideally founded both ritually and socially and uh, practically upon this, this metaphor of commensality, communal dining. Um, and you have this other outlaw society, which is the world of the, the, the warriors and the pirates and these uh, people who, who destroy. And it would make a very interesting little paper if you looked at all the references to these pirates uh, or these people who go on raids and destroy. Um, and what you can reconstruct as to that culture here. Yeah. It, it, it would be a nice little essay. Does that answer your point? Uh, thank you, that's, that's very interesting. Bill, how about your question? Are you still here? Yeah, um, great lecture, by the way, a lot to think about. So, simple question, Calypso, maybe she gets a pass because she's a goddess, but was she a bad hostess for keeping him so long? Ah, very, very subtle question. <laughs> nice question, Bill. Um, was she a bad hostess? Uh, he was there for seven years and in many traditions he had a son with her and that son in certain traditions later kills Odysseus. Um, certainly with, with Kirki, Circe, you can say that she is a uh, bad hostess at times and a good hostess at times and Odysseus's men become fed up after a year. They say, you have to stop sleeping with this woman, let's go, we want to go. So. I think Calypso is sad when Hermes comes to her and says, uh, Odysseus has to leave, as Zeus has decided. That is how I would address that point. Um, they sleep together, they eat meals together, they don't eat the same food because Calypso is a deity and she eats ambrosial food, but she does offer to make uh, Odysseus immortal, Bill. So again, it, it, it's a nice little point you've raised. It, it would make a very interesting paper as to what's happening on the island of Calypso. Um, and why, why the poets are so fascinated with this? Why does the, the mention of Calypso occur again and again and again throughout the, the, the song? There's something very important about uh, this, this place and this person. Does that answer your point? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, you talked about plot. Would you say that the Odyssey is a fractal plot, fractal, a fractal plot? Especially um, when you mentioned the arrows and, you know. Uh, fractal, F -R yeah, fractal. F -R -A -C -T -A -L. Yeah, yes. yeah, fractal. F-R-A-C-T-A-L, yes. Yeah, fractal. Well, it's, why would somebody compose a, a poem of this complexity, of this narrative complexity? Is it that the, this is how the, the poets broke up the elements and so that they could use them as mnemonic points? Is this the work of addition later on in classical times where many traditions were fused together into one song? And people have studied the Homeric Iliad and said, well, um, certain traditions like the tradition of Memnon were used by the poets or by the editors, by the, the, those who were inspired or by the works of addition to compose the Homeric Iliad. And what you have in the Homeric Iliad with Diomedes in scroll five is 
it's almost a, it's strangely absurd. It doesn't quite fit. But what we have in the Homeric Odyssey is, I would agree with you, it's, it's, it's fractal. It is this very complex system which nevertheless fits together perfectly. That is why it's, it's this extraordinary work of art. Um, and it's almost inhuman how that has been composed. It's very difficult to do something like that, I would imagine, particularly when you have these two kinds of narrative, well, that which is plot and that which is story. So is that? Yes, thank you. Thank it's you. a yes. very difficult question. <laughs> Kevin, how, does, how about the name of the Cyclops? How does the image of a wheel relate to how the story fits together? Well, again, I would say, what would the late Bronze Age poets think about that? Would they, is the, is the motif of a wheel um, something that they, was a, 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 a metaphor in their production? Is it something that they, they used elsewhere? Um, because it, you can't just say this is only happening to the, the, the Cyclops. If, if this is a valid argument, Keith, it has to happen elsewhere. Um, and what are those, metaphor is not quite the right word. It's almost like a motif um, where you have a theme in music, which, which is like a sonata, which has, has a certain circular performance. Uh, I don't know. I, I, would, I don't know how to answer that, Keith. I would have to go and look at how the poets deal, dealt with wheels elsewhere, this idea of um, the wheel of epic poetry, of, of, the, of um, the wheel of epic song, somebody who fits the wheel together. It's, it's an interesting question, but I think it's very difficult to find data for that. So, but it's, it's, a, it's a very nice idea. I don't know whether the, the Hebrew poets have uh, make use of the, the, the idea of a wheel in their compositions. Mm. Yeah, I can't think of any connections at the moment. In, in, in the Indian tradition, the wheel is very much a metaphor of law. The wheel is the, the symbol, the metaphor of how the legal system works, which is referred to as dharma, that which holds everything together and which goes round. So, but I don't know whether you could do much with the cyclops and the wheel, but it's a very interesting question and worth thinking about, but you have to have evidence. Exactly. Well, I think um, you all, we should, we should end here. Thank you for joining us. Thanks again, Kevin, for this wonderful talk very illuminating. And I just want to um, put in another plug for the course that you're teaching. Um, you've suggested that um, many of these questions could become papers. And to all of you out there, if you would like to write papers uh, for Dr. McGrath, um, this course is starting very soon at the Extension School. So. Thank you, Guy. Right. Thank you, everybody, Thanks. for inviting me. I so enjoyed this, the discussions today.